Good evening, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Eric Hayden with the National Weather Service in Moorhead City. I'm joined by a lot of folks from the town of Beaufort. We'll introduce those folks here in a second. Uh, this is our virtual hurricane forum. We started doing these last year. We would come into your community, give a presentation, talk with local officials, and give you a chance to ask questions uh, that you have about hurricane preparedness. Doing the same thing this year, but we're all at home. So just a little bit different. Uh, the format is slightly different, but we still want to make sure you get that information. We have a lot of new folks moving to the area each year, so this could be some new information for some of you. And for others, um, you may have seen this before, but it could be a different aspect, especially when we talk about the different impacts you can have from tropical cyclones. My name is Eric Hayden. As I mentioned, I'm a warning coordination meteorologist, just a fancy term for a liaison between the Weather Service and the community. I'm gonna go over a few technical aspects of tonight. Then we're gonna turn it over to the town of Beaufort. Uh, they're gonna give a talk and show you some cool websites for information for specific folks in the um, town itself. Then around 6.50, I'm gonna give a presentation that's gonna talk about why you should not focus on just the category of the storm, that any cyclone can produce a lot of impacts, not just wind, but things like storm surge, flooding, rip currents, and even tornadoes. And then at the end, please hang on. We're gonna turn it over to you for questions. If you're just joining us, if you have to drop out, I know we're getting close to the kids' bedtime, some folks are eating dinner. This is all going to be recorded. With your email that you signed up for, uh, tomorrow I will send you the link to YouTube. So you'll be able to see this um, and see all the links that we're talking about in that recording that we send out tomorrow. So just kind of sit back and hang tight and uh, watch our presentation here coming up. One quick tech aspect, if you're watching on a personal computer, it may look like this. If you're watching on a mobile device, iPhone, Android, or an iPad, um, you can also ask questions. If you sl uh, swipe left or right, you can do a full screen presentation or full screen webcam. Uh, you can do however you want. Ask the question whenever you want through that webinar format, and we'll take those questions at the end. At the very end, when we go through all the questions, if you have a verbal question, click on this raised hand feature. We'll acknowledge that you raised your hand and then we'll call on you. We'll unmute your microphone and then you can ask us a verbal question about what we just presented. So again, if something comes up, something's not clear that we talk about, you have a question about it, don't wait until the end, just ask us through the webinar and then we'll tally up those questions here at the end. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the town of Beaufort. Uh, Rachel's going to uh, load up some websites as we have in the background. So I'm going to go over to her and share her screen so she can uh, do that with you. We have a lot of good information. I really, really appreciate the town joining us. We've got the mayor, the fire chief, police chief, and the public information officer. So I love seeing the support uh, you all have in the town of Beaufort. You're very, very lucky to have that type of support. And they have a lot of good information. I'm going to talk some science with you, but I want you to listen very carefully to some of what they're going to present in terms of real life information. They've been through storms before, a lot of experience in our town, and I appreciate they, those uh, folks joining us tonight. So the floor is all yours, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you want to start out. All right. Well, thanks, Eric. And, and first of all, just thank you for hosting this important webinar. We really appreciate it. And while we've got your expertise uh, here with us, do you mind just giving us a, a summary of uh, Invest 94 and your thoughts there? Yeah. So we've been watching it the last couple of days. It has a 40 percent chance of turning into something uh, that something could be a tropical depression later this week. The impact on us is really not going to change. However, I can hear the rain on my roof right now. Uh, Rachel mentioned having some heavier rain earlier today. We're going to see periods of heavy rain has already started, and that will last right into the weekend. Could have a little bit of issues with some flooding, especially during those periods of heavy rain, and also an enhanced risk of rip currents. As far as wind goes, not a lot of wind. We might be a little breezy along the immediate coastline, otherwise not a big deal. So, Mayor, not a big difference if we see a name storm or depression or not. Pretty much what you see is what you get. The rain we had today is going to last right into at least the first part of the weekend. Well, thank you. We, we greatly appreciate our partnership with the National Weather Service as well. Um, we want to continue to increase our resilience in the town of Beaufort, both as a community and also as individual households. And it's really important for us to capture the lessons learned that we gain from each one of these storms. For instance, Hurricane Florence 
went south of us and just kind of stayed uh, on off on the coast for about three days. We got about 30 inches of, of water there. But one of the key components there is, you know, before Hurricane Florence, we were always talking about making sure everybody had three days of supplies. Well, we were at without power for seven days and uh, people started running out of food. And, and Chief uh, Ray will, will expand on that. But but anyway, uh, that was that was uh, followed up quickly by Hurricane Michael. And the real lesson learned there was it was really quick to evolve and to move and to, to move into a very powerful storm. And then last year we had Hurricane Dorian that we, we were actually in the eye wall for about four hours and storm surge became really apparent, especially on the north facing communities like Cedar Island or, or Ocracoke where they had a seven foot storm surge there. And then again, capturing the lessons learned uh, for uh, Hurricane Isaias, uh, it was a category one, at which normally we wouldn't be uh, too concerned about, except for in this case, the storm surge. Uh, that that appeared and we were supposed to get one to three feet of storm surge and if you see on the chart that Rachel just brought up we got the one foot at high tide we got the three uh, three foot surge at uh, low tide and so we were very fortunate uh, that that those were were not closely linked to a high tide at three foot storm surge but if, if you also look at the geometry of Oak Island and Southport it looks very similar to what we have with Bogue Banks in the town of Beaufort. So we wanna take our lessons learned from them because they really got hammered by storm surge. And, and so let's learn from all of these storms uh, for your individual resilience and certainly as a town. Uh, chief Tony Ray is our fire chief and he's also our, our emergency manager. So, so Tony, uh, let me turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to push what we keep talking about, and you'll hear multiple times this evening, about we're trying to get away from the idea of the category of the storms or winds alone. Um, Hurricane Florence was one of our best lessons learned where it sat upon us pretty much for 50 hours. And that's where you start getting into 25 plus inches of rain. So it wasn't just the wind, now we had the water. Not much of a storm surge of Hurricane Florence. Um, saw a lot of damage, I would say, back on the boat banks with Atlantic Beach and those areas and the washover. Um, what I'm gonna look at in preparedness would be the first idea in preparedness is the idea of evacuation. Uh, North Carolina has adopted a know your zone now. So when we look at evacuation and leaving town, everyone has their own opinions about I'm leaving or I'm not leaving things, but North Carolina is working with the Know Your Zone program now. This is Carteret County. If you look over to the legend to the right, you'll start to see the evacuations now announced in A, B, and C. Um, just a little bit of information there how this zone goes. This is all I believe on the Weather Services webpage. Uh, Carter County Mercy Management is found on, and Rachel will have it up on the Beaufort Town website. So the idea of evacuation and all the excuses we hear or reasons we hear for not evacuating. Um, I'd like to go into that as we go through this whole thing, but the idea of evacuating, I cannot push it enough. Hurricane Florence was a category one. How many would repeat living five to seven days without electricity? When we think about the impact of not having electricity, if you depend on oxygen for, as a medication, if you depend on ice or cold keeping medications cold for yourself or your child. You start looking at five to seven days duration, it's hard to think about you've put that much groceries back. Now you think about medication. Now you think about the welfare of your family. So the idea of going back to evacuation, I push this in every speech I give. If we can get you out, you're not a burden on the system at some point. We had after three to four days after Hurricane Florence, we had people approaching our emergency services and we're out of food. That's just it. So you'll hear us talk about prepping now for five to 10 days, you know, because we've seen what it can be. When it gets dark at night and there's no electricity, there's no street lights, it's a new dark that we're not used to. So the idea of what happened in the town of Beaufort through Hurricane Florence, it was dark. We didn't have electricity. That piece of normalcy was gone. But thanks to our utility department, toilets flushed and water ran. Think about if that had been taken away from us in any type of storm event. That has a whole new sense of no normalcy. Thing. So we're gonna push on that direction. We'll look at preparedness and we're always gonna talk about having a go or a disaster kit. 
if you're not going to leave, if you're not going to look for shelter out of the county, uh, and you prepare yourself and don't just focus on the category of storm. We look at the wind and now this storm surge. We'll have some slides coming up in a few minutes that show Mexico Beach after Hurricane Michael, category four. We'll go back to a few weeks ago. What happened in Louisiana, a category four that pretty much went from a tropical storm in less than 30 hours to a category four hurricane before landfall. And we'll look at some of what the storm surge did. Um, We'll go back to the uh, disaster kit first, and let's talk preparedness, and we'll get a little bit further into the idea of category. In the preparedness kit, when I go to what I call the four big F words, food, fuel, facilities. And uh, so number one is few, food. Now we talk, I get I hear so many times, um, well, I just, I cannot prepare. I cannot put back. I do not have the resources to put back for food. My thing is that we all know the hurricanes are a reality in the area we live. So if you go this week and you buy an extra can of beans and next week you buy two extra cans of corn, you can prepare yourself. These are non-perishable type items that you want to keep. Understand, are they going to need refrigeration? We hope not. If you lose electricity, are you prepared for that? Um, so also think about where you store your supplies. They need to be high up. If we're going to think about flood and we're going to think about storm surge, think about how things are kept and prepared. Number one being food. Number two, fuel. How many of you sat last year, if you stayed through Hurricane Florence, stood in two hour lines for a can of gas to run your generator? Or you sat in your car for two hours waiting to get gasoline in your vehicle. My question there is, where are you going? Thanks. So we started looking at fuel, especially for generators. I have to go into generator safety and think about how you're using your generator. Things, but prepare if you can ahead of time, have your fuel supplies ready down to propane, can, propane cans are great for cooking with. You know, they're also, you can use them on your different lanterns. Uh, um, next, coming down to facilities, your home. Is it prepared? That's where most of us are going to shelter. So is your home prepared? Is your home ready for a category three? Let's go to 130 miles an hour winds. Let's go to category four to 150. Are you prepared to stay in that home thinking that? We'll show pictures of what that does in a few minutes. Um, toiletry, personal hygiene items, prepare yourself. Water, one of the biggest resources we need. We can go a long time without food, but water is a natural source we must need. So think about having a gallon a day per person for up to five to 10 days is our recommended um, part. We talked about food, manual can openers, be able to use your food, uh, clothing, prepare dry clothing, dry usable type clothing for long duration. Things, blankets, pillows, first aid kits, medications, Check your check your cabinets. Um, and we come down through flashlights, you know, the simple things. A battery operated weather radio. Eric, I'm gonna get that in there for you. A battery operated weather radio. Cash and ID cards. Cash and ID cards, do an inventory on your home, have things ready for the after effect where if you need to file insurance or those things. If you kept children, you must think about toys. You must think about things gonna keep yourself entertained and chargers for all our cell phones, one of the biggest things we need. Uh, now we'll move forward and look like I, well, I'm gonna to try to convince you to please evacuate. If we would have told earlier in the week when Hurricane Florence was coming, Hurricane Florence was a category four. This is Mexico Beach that was about a month after Hurricane Dorian last year. Hurricane Michael came through at 100 to 140, 150 mile an hour winds when it hit Mexico Beach. This is what we call preferably total destruction. And I heard people say so many times, well, I don't wanna leave because I'm not gonna be able to get back. It's just what you're gonna stay here to try to get back to. You know, hopefully these people did evacuate. When we talk evacuations, we have to talk about our declarations of emergency that are, we file or we put up and you see on the websites or you see announced throughout town. You have a couple types of declaration of emergencies. The important ones are voluntary evacuation and mandatory evacuation. When we move into the scale of mandatory evacuation, what this means at a certain point during these storms, for a duration of four to five or maybe 24 hours like we saw at Dorian, conditions are gonna get so bad that we cannot put our emergency workers out there. Or we really have to start evaluating everything. So if you're able to get a call in for help, now we're trying to we've put another burden on the system. 
we go further and we look at Laura, uh, some of the other kind of pictures that came in from a couple weeks ago. Rachel, you wanna bring those up? Here it we go, this is Hurricane Laura Cameron, Alabama. This is a 15 to 20 foot storm surge. We hear so much about, they say, well, they didn't get the storm surge predicted. Yes, they did in a small space. The storm surge moved east of what they thought the hit would be. This is what saved a lot of Lake Charles coming straight up the coastline. This is Laurel, Mississippi, I'm sorry, Laurel, Louisiana. Laurel is a population of 600 to 1,000 people. This is devastation. This is what we see here moved quite a ways inland, and then it pushed upstream. This is a 15 foot wall of water coming at you. And we go to other pictures with Laurel. Um, and next one, please, Rachel. Uh, any picture, it, it, there we go. Okay, yeah, it jumps in I'll go back to what the mayor keyed in a second ago. The Bogue Banks and the Beaufort area, we have an east-west orientation to the coast. That means that the same thing as Oak Island has an east-west orientation to the coast. So um, Ocean Isle, which we'll have a picture in a second of, Ocean Isle has a more north-south orientation. An east-west orientation means most hurricanes are coming from the south to southwest. We are going to take it on the nose. This is what happened to Oak Island. Oak Island with Hurricane ESCS came in as a barely a category one, came in the middle of the night. A lot of folks I know in Oak Island, I live there. A lot of folks I know, they woke up the next morning and these vehicles are thrown around like toys. You know, there's a hundreds of vehicles lost in this. As far as I know, the uh, west or west end of the island is still pretty much blocked off as they're trying to restore the public utilities on that end of the island. So any type of recovery is being that much halted as it goes forward. Ocean Isle, during this same period of time, We'll show you the result of Ocean Isle and what comes into my world. I'm sorry, here we are at Southport. All right, we'll stay with Ocean Isle. Ocean Isle being a north-south orientation, this was a wind-driven wind fire coming. This was three separate residential units, three separate residential units. These fires at that night, they had seven fully involved fires on the island that night. Wind driven like that is just a whole new thing to try to deal with. They were calling for resources from Myrtle Beach, a hundred miles away, they were trying to get help into this. So we have a tendency to think about the rain, the wind, now the storm surge. Now this is the after effects of the fires. The next day they had fire, five fully involved fires on the island. As people were trying to get generators going, there was a few events that involved with vehicles uh, catching on fire. So we go back and look at a few things. If you're not gonna leave, please be prepared. Please have yourself well prepared. Southport, North Carolina, some of the prettiest docks that were ever built were in this part of Southport and that part of North Carolina. And this is the after effect the next day. This is not preparation. Look what happens here when we talk about hurricanes. You see all the boats disappear. They did not prepare. This sits approximately a mile inland. You know, so this gives you an idea of the wind driven and the storm driven surge things. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass this over as um, Rachel, I'm going to come back to you. All right, before I get too involved in uh, what I was going to speak about, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Bordet to get his perspective from the police department during, department during uh, weather situations. I think he had a call. Oh, sorry. All right. Well, um, let me let me just jump right in then to communications. So part of the lessons learned um, that definitely came through Florence is make sure you have multiple ways of receiving information during the storms. Um, for town information, our website is a great resource in the days leading up to a storm. However, like we saw during Florence, um, internet service can go out. So at that point, um, sometimes we are able to, from our personal cell phones, update the town's Facebook page. So um, the Facebook page is a great resource. It's also a very up to the minute um, for information because as you you all know, things can change very rapidly. Um, so we have the regular town of Beaufort Facebook page. We have the Beaufort Police Department and the Beaufort Fire Department. Um, we're also on Twitter. Um, during a, an event, the mayor um, does, we do post daily video updates on the town's Facebook page. 
Um, you can also sign up for an email list for our sunshine list. Typically in the days prior to a storm, we are able to get an email out. But again, like we've seen in the past, sometimes our email servers go down. So just make sure you have multiple outlets. Also highly recommend Code Red Emergency Alert System. And then, um, of course, paying attention to radio and things like that. And forgive me real fast, I'm gonna jump out of that screen. Just wanna take you on a quick look at the town's website. So the town's website, anytime there's an event going on up here at the top where it says COVID-19 information and resources, it will say the name of whatever hurricane or emergency that we are facing at that time. And so if you click it, it'll take you straight into all the resources that are available. Um, so that is our current COVID-19 situation. Um, now year round, we have hurricane proper preparedness and information. There are an absolute ton of resources of what to do before a disaster, after a disaster, um, during a disaster. So I encourage you strongly to check those out. Um, also, just to make sure you're familiar with the look of the town's Facebook page, it is, um, this is the town of Beaufort's official page. Um, so if you have any questions or anything about any of the information that is covered tonight and your questions don't get answered, always feel free to reach out to us um, at the town of Beaufort. Um, my email is rjohnson at beaufortnc.com. And I'm going to turn it back over. Forgive me, I am not able to see if Chief Burdett is back, but I'm going to send it back yeah. over to Eric. Yeah, Chief Burdett is on if, if you wanted to add um, some chief. Yeah, I was just say I apologize. I lost my internet. The storm's coming through here. Uh, just to dovetail off of what Chief Ray was saying, uh, just heed the warnings uh, and the various parameters for states of emergency because uh, the putting our staff at increased risk because you stay behind um, is dangerous for everyone. Uh, and more often than not, when these things come through and we lose power, uh, as Chief Ray was talking about, it's a different kind of darkness and you can't see the dangers that are out there. Um, so if, if you do happen to decide to stay, please stay inside your residence until it's communicated that it's clear for you to come back out uh, because we will be doing damage assessments and we need to do that uninterrupted and unblocked by uh, folks you know, trying to get out and drive around. And I apologize if that's reiterating what you already talked about. I Very, very good. Well, I appreciate having all of you on. It's nice to hear the perspective and the history that you have and some of the tips that, that you talk about to the community. We'll have to add those to our talks. So if you're good on your end, Rachel, I'll jump in and take control back. Uh, we'll uh, finish the presentation and then we'll turn it over to everybody uh, for questions. So great job from the town of Beaufort. We're, we're certainly in good hands. Unfortunately, we have a lot of practice in the last couple of years uh, for storms, um, but we're certainly in good hands there. So um, again, you all can um, turn off your webcams and mic if you want, um, but please stick around for the end for the Q&A session. So the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to do a presentation on tropical cyclones. Um, it's a lot of what Chief Ray mentioned in terms of preparedness and not focusing on just a category. We really want you to focus on a lot of things, specifically water, because unfortunately that has is really what has been killing people here uh, with tropical cyclones, uh, much more so than the wind. The time for preparation is really now. You might say, well, of course it is, Eric. You, you already talked about something for the end of the week. You, um, you know, if you've been watching the, the weather, we have multiple storms out in the ocean. It's a very, very busy part of the season. If you were to see this presentation in May, June, July, I would say the whole, the same thing, because here in Eastern North Carolina, we've had storms as early as May. Just think back to this year with Tropical Storm Arthur. The traditional peak, this red and yellow on the map, is around September 9th or 10th. We've had storms around the 9th or 10th. Dorian and Florence. Uh, I keep seeing those memories on my Facebook feed uh, showing up of the preparation for that. And we've had storms as late as Matthew and Sandy into the month of October. So realistically, even though hurricane season starts June 1st, your preparation should start in early May here in Eastern North Carolina, because we've had storms early, we've had storms in August, and we've certainly had them in September and October. Rachel mentioned one way to prepare. Uh, you can get a lot of information on the Town of Beaufort website. There's a lot to digest tonight. You can look back at the recording. We will also, in that email, include these links. So feel free to write them down. If it's too much, you don't have a pen, you're, you're just getting to the presentation, don't worry. Again, we'll have the recording and we'll also have those hyperlinks in the email. 
One good website that will be in our email is weather.gov slash Moorhead City. That's our local page. And if you go forward slash hurricane prep, a lot of good information on there. The chief mentioned you know, your disaster kit. We've got information on that information about know your zone if you want to dial down and see what zone you're in across Carteret county we've got information on that storm surge tornadoes rip currents anything tropical storm hurricane related is on that website so please check it out it's brand new we made it this past spring and we're really proud of it because we think it has a lot of good information um, all through the weather service and we kind of consolidated it into one spot Another real good thing to monitor on our website are our briefings. I know our core partners know what I'm talking about, but those in the public, you can get this type of information during a Florence, a Dorian, a severe weather outbreak, a winter storm. If you go to our website, past the map itself on the bottom, there's a lot of icons and there's one called a weather hazard briefing. We don't put these out all the time. It's again, ahead of a big weather event. And the example on the right is from Arthur. Uh, this last May. It's a PDF document. It may start off as a slide or two when there's a lot of unknowns, and then it may be 15 or 20 slides when we have something like Florence. A lot of information, if you want to dive down and know what the surge is and the rainfall forecast for your area is, the briefing is something you really need to check out. Let's say you don't have time to check something like that out and you want the quick snippet. You want to scroll by your phone and get the information in 30 seconds or less. So that's what our social media channels are designed to do, especially Facebook and Twitter. We really capture what is the most important point we tweeted out. We do a Facebook point. So prior to Florence, as the chief mentioned, it was a category four. It really got our attention. But we don't want people to focus on just a category because as that number lowered, we started to get the question, do we, don't have to, do we not have to worry about it anymore? Is it gonna miss us? Are we not gonna see any impacts? No, no, no. So we sent out a tweet about that, that we still expect catastrophic flooding, don't let your guard down, uh, that type of thing. YouTube is a little longer. Any of those briefings we give to public officials, usually five to seven minutes, we'll do a recorded briefing, uh, or it's live, and then we'll take the recording of that, and we'll put it on YouTube. Again, it's not something that you're going to get 30 seconds in and, and know exactly what's happening. It's a lot of in-depth information. It's really good stuff, and I encourage you to check it out. By the way, this uh, class, this virtual forum, will be on YouTube by tomorrow morning, along with our spotter training and some other educational activities. So that's a little bit about who we are. Again, we'll send you the links, but just remember weather.gov slash Moorhead City for your forecast, and then also hurricane preparedness information. I love this graphic because I love the people that I work with, not only at the office in Moorhead City, but also down at the Hurricane Center. They have over 175 years of experience. Please get out of this graphic to focus on official um, forecasts from the National Hurricane Center. It's fun to look at models like this. Uh, these are called spaghetti models. I did just have a little spaghetti um, with my dinner earlier today. That's not why we put on there. Uh, th these are called spaghetti models because they show multiple scenarios that could happen. They have some utility with a trained meteorologist where they're close together here. We call it a tight clustering. That means high confidence. Where they spread out, low confidence. So they have some utility, but while they're fun to look at, please focus on the official forecast itself. The men and women down at the Hurricane Center, they look at the ensembles. They look at all of them. I often get the question, is the European model better? Is the GFS model better? We like the model that's doing the best and we usually take what's called a consensus of all the models to come up with the forecast. And it's darn, darn well. With Hurricane Laura, just a couple mile, a couple mile error at 90 hours out. Same thing with Florence, we saw a very, very accurate track forecast. So please, while it's fun, especially farther out in time to look at what might happen, as we start to get into the thick of things, look at the official forecast and share that type of information on social media. You don't realize how much power you have when you share that information. So share the official information so your friends, families, and neighbors are looking at the good stuff. Now you might say, come on, Eric, you, you work for the National Weather Service, of course you're gonna say it's the best and it's really, really good. I like to back things up with statistics. So if you've lived around here for a while, 
our storm of record, especially with regards to rainfall flooding before Matthew, before Florence, was certainly Floyd. And we've made a huge stride in terms of uh, track forecasting, in terms of error. So this graphic is showing you in 1999, this huge circle shows our average error at three days out. So if we are three days out from landfall and the storm was supposed to hit along the Carolinas, we could say that it could be anywhere from Georgia through South North Carolina or Southeast Virginia. So imagine the chief trying to make preparations and evacuation plans with Carter County based on something with that much error. That was 1999. Flip forward now to 2019 with Dorian, the average error has shrunk down tremendously. Uh, now the error would put it somewhere over southeastern North Carolina. So the track forecasting has gotten really accurate. I'm going to mention here in a slide um, to, you know, while it's accurate, still give it a little wiggle room because there can be some deviation from it. But for all intents and purposes, we saw it with Dorian, we saw it with Florence, we saw it with Laura. The track forecasting has uh, improved a lot and will continue to do so uh, with such talent down at the Hurricane Center. Now, where do we struggle? We still have some challenges with intensity forecasting. Three days before landfall, our most powerful um, hurricanes, you know, down the road eventually, were only tropical storms. The Labor Day storm in 1933, Andrew in 1992, and Camille in the 60s. And all these tracks took it across Florida or into the Gulf of Mexico. So you might say, Eric, why are you showing you showing us uh, tracks of storms that di didn't really impact us? It wouldn't be a hard sell to say, especially the Labor Day or Andrew storm could have made a turn to the right up the coast and impacted us. So please, in your preparation, have your preparation and plans made today. Don't wait for when it's just a tropical storm or a low end a hurricane to come up the coast and say, I don't have to worry about it. And then it strengthens to a two or a three. And then you start to get your corn or your beans or wondering where your full fuel supplies are. Do those things that the chief said now, tomorrow, the next day. So then if the intensity increases quickly, you can make that quick decision. Do I have a family down in South Carolina? Talk to them. Do I have family up in Maryland? Uh, where, where do you have places that you can go? Talk about those decisions now so that if we get caught off guard with a rapidly intensifying storm, that you can make those uh, decisions much more quickly. So please keep that in mind. Have your plan today. Is your hurricane kit ready? Do you need any help with it? Go to our website, again, Moorhead City uh, slash Hurricane Prep, and we'll send you that link afterwards. We want to go through a couple more websites. In addition to ours, one of the best ones you can bookmark is Hurricanes. Gov. Again, it's hurricanes.gov. This is a tropical weather outlook. This is issued four times a day. It shows where the uh, tropical cyclone activity uh, could form in the next five days. It'll be color coded. So these aren't tracks, but these are areas where this formation could occur. So in this example, a medium chance across the central Atlantic Ocean, a low chance south of the uh, Caribbean, and then Gaston was a hurricane well out to sea when this was taken. I'm going to hop out of the presentation and um, talk a little bit what the mayor mentioned, the Invest 94L. Uh, so this is the Hurricane Center website. This is live right now. I know you've probably seen on the, on the news a um, couple of tropical storms well uh, out to sea, one that we're carefully watching that's uh, still off the coast of Africa that um, we may have to continue to watch over the next couple of weeks. And then this disturbance to the southwest of Bermuda, it's got a 30% chance over the next 48 hours. And as we mentioned off the top, a 40% chance over the next five days. Um, if you go down to the five-day um, graphical, you can see, again, it's not per se a track, but it's roughly in this area. If it were to form over the next couple of days, it would be toward our coastline. Our impacts really won't change, whether it gets a name, whether it's a tropical depression, the rain you hear outside now, that will continue into the weekend. Enhanced chance for rip currents. Those are our two big concerns, regardless of if it gets a name or not. And then also a little breezy toward the coastline. Uh, looks like more so over the Outer Banks than necessarily exactly uh, where we are here in Carteret County. So back to the Hurricane Center website. I know, I know you've seen this forecast cone before. Uh, this is the most probable path for the center of the storm. And you might say, Eric, that's re really, really specific wording. And there's a reason for that. This does not show the impacts. 
It does not show who's going to see the storm surge. It doesn't say how much rain is going to fall. It doesn't talk about how large the storm is. This cone is actually made based on statistical error based over the last five years. So at 12 hours, 24, 36, circles are drawn. And based on that statistical error, the cone will be wider, farther out in time, and more narrow, close in time. And if you've been, so it has nothing to do with the storm. It doesn't mean that it's a wider storm or smaller storm or anything like that. And if you've noticed that the cone has shrunk uh, because of that accuracy down at the hurricane center. So uh, two thirds of the time, it's the center's gonna go in the track. But what I want you to remember is impacts occur well away from the center. A hurricane is not a dot. Uh, East Aeas hit down toward Oak Island, correct? But we still had impacts up here. Dorian hit uh, near Cape Hatteras, but we still had impacts here. Florence didn't hit in our area. The exact point went over Wrightsville Beach. But tell that to folks in Onslow County that had 25 to 30 inches of, of rain. Tell that to folks in New Bern that had 8 to 12 feet of storm surge. So again, this forecast cone is good as a tool to know that if you're in the general vicinity of the storm, you should pay attention. It's not a, I'm in it, I need to worry. I'm out of it, I don't have to worry. No, on this graphic right here, uh, those folks from uh, South Carolina, all the way down, you know, uh, up through the Delmarva, anywhere by this cone, this is with Florence, uh, should be concerned. So please remember that it only shows the most probable path for just the center itself. There's a couple other really good graphics for when you need to make your preparation. So you've got your kit. Now you want to know when should I board up uh, if you choose to do that? Uh, when should I leave if you choose to do that? There's a graphic called the earliest reasonable onset or arrival time of tropical storm force winds. This is a, a worst case scenario. Um, if you have everything done, you leave, you're boarded up, whatever your, your decision is, by this time, you're going to be okay. Uh, so in this case, this is Florence. It would be sometime Wednesday evening. Um, this is something that I keep in mind. I'm working 10, 12 hour shifts leading up to the storm and I have a list, you know, bring in this stuff uh, to the shed, uh, make sure I don't leave stuff outside. Um, do the, does the family know where they're going? Let's talk about that. Uh, starting our plan. We need to have everything done and ready and out of here by this uh, reasonable worst case scenario. The other graphic is a most likely time. That's when we think the winds will pick up and you might say well why tropical storm force that's 39 mile per hour winds that's when emergency services usually don't go out that's when we start to pull things back uh, and it's unsafe to be out there so why that's why we use that threshold the most likely again is when we think it's going to happen i like to use the uh, earliest reasonable um, because that's a reasonable worst case if you are wrapped up by then uh, you should be okay so Chief Ray mentioned this before about the category um, of storms. We talk about this all the time. This is called the Saffir Simpson scale. It's really good for what it is. It's um, used to estimate or um, categorize hurricane strength and potential property damage only based on wind. Has nothing to do with rainfall, storm surge. Is the storm 400 miles across or 100 miles across? Is it gonna be over us for four days like Florence or is it in and out of here like Dorian? It has nothing uh, to say about those aspects. And people fixate on the category a, a little too much. I, I am certainly not saying if it's a three, four, five, don't worry about it. What I'm saying is it's only a part of the puzzle. It's not the whole thing. You need to look at the whole aspect of the storm uh, when you make your decisions. A couple of examples, raise your hand if you've heard a neighbor, family member um, say, I'm not gonna leave unless it's at least a three. I'm not gonna leave unless it's a four. Or I've been through a two before, I can, we can do that again. Number one, again, the category only talks about wind. You don't know how much rain, surge, or how long it'll be. And for folks that say, oh, I've been through a two or three or, or a one before, it really depends on where it hit. Think back to Dorian. If uh, you're on the left side of the storm, kind of like we were from Beaufort westward across the county, wasn't a huge deal like it was the east side of the storm, closer to Hatteras Island with the storm surge on Ocracoke. So it really depends on where you are in terms of where the storm hit. And no two storms are like. Just because you made it through a, a one or two before doesn't mean the exact same things are going to happen. It really depends on each storm, and it's quite unique. 
And that really leads us into the section on impacts. If you get anything out of this talk, make your plan today, tomorrow, get going on that. And next time we get a storm, because you know we're going to get another one at some point, look at the whole package. Don't just focus on the category. Since 2010, we've had a lot of just category ones, things like Irene, Isaac, Sandy, Hermine, uh, Matthew, Florence, all these ring a bell. Just under 200 people have died from just category ones and over $100 billion in damage. So again, I don't want to hear it's just a category one or two. You got to look at the whole puzzle uh, when you're trying to make your decision. And that's what we're going to emphasize over the next couple slides. Then we're going to turn it over to you uh, for any questions you have. So if you're just joining us, it's not too late. Put your question in the chat and we'll, we'll answer those uh, at the end. And again, if you are just joining us, we are recording this. Uh, so you'll have a chance to look back at it uh, once we post it to YouTube. First thing we're going to talk about is water, water, water. Uh, traditionally, about 90% of deaths with tropical cyclones between the mid-60s and 2012 was water. Uh, mostly storm surge, about third rain, and we had some surf or rip current uh, related um, incidents. You might say, okay, Eric, it's, it's 2012. Do we have any new statistics? Maybe those are just some old statistics. Unfortunately, uh, since uh, 2016 to 2018, instead of near 90% water related, it's 83%, so it hasn't changed much. Most of this is inland flooding and not surge related. So we have made some improvements. Um, despite the devastation on Ocracoke and, and uh, Hatter's Island with Dorian, despite the storm surge on Bogue Banks, Highway 24 saw water, New Bern, uh, areas like that, the flash flooding, Duplin County, um, storm surge wise, we did not lose any lives. So we have made some improvements with that, um, that especially with regards to storm surge watches and warnings, what we'll talk about. What we need to work on in terms of our messaging is most of our deaths with water are folks in vehicles. They see a road close sign and they choose to go around it. Or they see, um, they go out at night and they don't realize the roads uh, covered with water or no longer there. It's very rare that, that they're at home and the water comes up and it catches them off guard. Usually it's vehicle related deaths. So they're either out where they shouldn't be or going through water and they don't, they don't realize it because it's at night, something to that example. We need your help. We're scientists, we're gonna always strive to get it right. Sometimes we're gonna get it wrong, sometimes we're gonna get it right. But as I showed you from the track forecast, uh, and this example is the rainfall forecast, we continue to make leaps and bounds in terms of improvement on the forecast itself. This example on the left is the uh, rainfall forecast for Florence uh, before Florence hit, showing the bullseye of you know 20 to 30 inches of rain. And on the right, the example is what happened. Uh, you're not going to do any better than that. Unfortunately, we lost 16 folks in Florence across the Carolinas that were in vehicles. So your new neighbors, your neighbor that has lived here 30 years, educate them, tell them that water's what's killing people and more than likely it's in vehicles. We see this a lot when people are coming back to their homes, they want to get here. Um, please don't let your guard down even after the storm has left. Um, it takes a lot of water to flow through some of our inland rivers a long time. Um, so again, don't let your guard down even days after the storm with regards to flooding. One last visual. I have pretty good eyesight. I'm getting up in my 40s, so it's starting to go a little bit, but I have pretty good eyesight. But I noticed this a lot the other day. I, I cannot see as well at night anymore. So think about driving at night and, and just stay home because it can be very dangerous. This example is during the daytime, but this is near Hookerton and, and Matthew. You might say, well, I may cross that. It depends on how, how strong the water is and, and things like that. You don't know not only how strong the water is, but is that road even there anymore? So please keep that in mind. Um, you know, don't go out at night. Don't don't let your guard down after the storm itself. And remember the motto uh, for the weather service is turn around, don't drown. Most are, of our deaths, again, occur, unfortunately, in vehicles. It's not uh, people that are home and the water comes up. We do have products that we issue, uh, flash flood warnings. I do want to mention this flash flood emergency and also the warning itself. Um, if you get an alert on your phone that says flash flood emergency or even a flash flood warning, and especially if you haven't signed up for something with our, our wonderful local uh, media, 
and it just comes across your phone on its own. It's, it's probably a weather uh, emergency alert, a WIA alert. And it's a wireless alert that comes, a wireless alert, emergency alert, and it will come across on your phone. And those are only issued for the big, big stuff. Major flash flooding, uh, tornado warning, storm surge warning, things like that. So especially when you get those types of products on your phone, uh, that means that you're being impacted, or at least the cell tower where you are itself. That segues into storm surge. Uh, we had eight to 11 feet north uh, west of us at New Bern. If you haven't seen some of the videos out at Ocracoke, this is just, just over a year ago. Um, it's amazing that Dorian was only a year ago and Florence was two. It's, it seems like it was five or six years ago. Um, so we can get storm surge. Uh, we can certainly get it in the town of Beaufort itself. Uh, so depending on where you live, you may be more susceptible to it. You may hear us use terminology like above normally dry ground. So when we issue storm surge watches or warnings, a watch is issued for three feet or greater um, out to 48 hours, and a warning is within 36 hours. What we mean is low-lying areas. So if you live near creeks and, and the sound, low spots, and you're normally dry, you could have greater than three feet of surge in those areas. A useful map that will show up on the Hurricane uh, Center website and our local website is the potential storm surge forecast. This is a reasonable worst case scenario. It's very, very useful for local officials to plan evacuations because while not everybody will see these values of surge in this example, um, the 10% chance is somebody will see, in this case, greater than nine feet in the New Bern area. Uh, so it's, it takes into account not only the storm track, um, the current track and the wind speed, it has some slight adjustments for if we're wrong. You know, one of these days, the, the intensity is going to change or we're going to be a little bit off of the track and we don't want people to let their guard down. So that's why this, this graphic here is very, very useful. Um, it's a reasonable worst case of what could happen with a particular storm with a little, you know, uh, left or right wiggle room in both intensity and track. So it's really, really good stuff to look at. At a higher level, we're doing an experimental graphic this year that you might have seen with Isaias. Um, and it, I don't think we had it with Arthur. I don't think we had to worry about storm surge, but it's kind of that 50,000 foot level. Hey, we're going to get four to six feet of surge along the coast. And then on the local site, you can uh, dive in and get some more specifics. So we talked about flooding, flash flooding. We talked about storm surge, rip currents. You might say, well, Eric, you know, uh, how, how's that related to storms? One of our deadliest storms last year was actually Hurricane Lorenzo. You might say, never heard of it. Well, it was 2,000 miles out to sea, very, very strong storm. Unfortunately, we lost four lives here along the North Carolina shore. I want you to remember this because um, number one, we'll, we'll talk about the disturbance off our coast now here in a second, but think about those tropical storms that are well out to sea. If they become full-blown hurricanes, we will still see the swell from those storms. If you have somebody coming down that spent money on a beach house, they, they've been waiting all summer for a vacation, it's sunny, it's 85, they may not perceive that threat from those long period swells. So we can get rip currents from distant storms that never are even close to us or ahead of storms that are near us. Um, so we mentioned at the top of this presentation, the uh, Invest 94L uh, could be a depression at the end of the week. Not a lot of difference on what happens, we're still going to see the rain and the enhanced chance of rip current. So please share that message uh, with family and friends, especially those that are not used to the beach. They, they don't go all the time. How to get out of a rip current, a uh, very, very narrow channel of water that pulls you out. It's a break in the sandbar. Um, if you try to fight it, you're swimming against it. You do not want to do that. If you swim left or right or parallel, once you're out of that very narrow stream, you can easily come back in. So please keep that in mind. We try to message that heavily on social media. Again, cutting through the noise, waving our hands, saying, I know it's a nice weekend, and it may not be obvious to you. It's not like a day with thunderstorms where you can hear it or see, you know, hear the thunder and see the lightning. It may be beautiful out, and that rip current risk is high. So please keep that in mind. A couple more slides, and we're going to turn it over to you. I don't want to belittle the wind threat. This is my neighborhood. Um, in uh, Hurricane Florence, we had a lot of wind damage to homes. We had uh, water issues, not only from surge, but also getting into the homes because we lost shingles, and it was a long duration event. Uh, so trees are, are a danger, falling on homes, um, blocking your way out, or 
uh, getting folks in. So they certainly can be an issue. And we saw that with Laura. Uh, the chief showed the storm surge um, impacts, but we had a lot of wind uh, with that storm as well. One last point to hammer home on the category scale. Again, respect it, it's part of the puzzle, but look at all of the impacts. Raise your hand if you remember Hurricane Arthur. Maybe, especially uh, areas down east in Carteret County. It was a Cat 2, a similar landfall around Cape Lookout, but it was fast moving and a smaller storm. So again, the biggest impacts were really from Beaufort East. So you may remember Arthur, uh, especially for folks over toward the Outer Banks, Inland, they're saying Arthur, but I don't really remember it. So for us, kind of on the fence because we were close to the, the center itself, but it was fast moving uh, and a much smaller storm. Do you remember Irene? Yes, the whole area remembers Irene, but it was just a one. No tricks, it was a similar landfall, but a much slower moving storm, a much larger storm. Uh, we had winds down East Carteret over 100 miles per hour. Um, again, the majority of the area saw 60 to 70 mile per hour winds, five to 15 inches of rain. So again, category is part of it. No two storms are alike. So please look at all the impacts. And you might say, well, do I have to be a meteorologist? Do I have to watch every news station? No. Watch whoever you're comfortable with. Your local media, uh, they do an excellent job in our area. The National Weather Service, the Hurricane Center, we spell it out for you. Uh, so you, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be a mind reader, just find your uh, favorite official source of information and follow it, and we'll certainly spell that out. The last aspect I want to talk about, and you might say, wow, isn't that enough? Tornadoes. Uh, this is Dorian. Uh, we had a, a tornado EF2 over 100 mile per hour winds in Emerald Isle. Uh, I still vividly remember this. Um, with Florence, a lot of us said, hey, I'm out of here. It was a no-brainer. With Dorian, kind of on the fence, it was just off the coast. If you decide to wait and leave, or if you decide to stay, make sure, as Chief Ray mentioned, you have that NOAA weather radio, you have got extra batteries, you've got your cell phone charged, it's on, it's not on do not disturb. These tornadoes can occur in those first bands as they move in, well, well ahead of the center itself. I mean, this is well ahead of the actual landfall. Uh, I think it was one of the first bands that came on the coast. I'll, I'll never for, forget being at work and uh, having the warning out and then seeing the, the tornado off the uh, uh, Vogue, uh, Vogue uh, Inlet Pier webcam, just, just unbelievable. Uh, so these can occur well ahead of the center. Um, they can produce enhanced areas of damage. So keep that in mind. If you decide to stay, hey, it's not, not a big storm, have those ways to get warnings so that you go from upstairs to downstairs, your pantry, lowest level away from windows for those enhanced winds. One last point on, hey, we get a landfall down toward Myrtle Beach or we get a landfall toward Wilmington. We don't have to worry about it. This red arrow is where Florence hit. The red dots are where we had tornadoes with Florence. So all across Eastern North Carolina and Southeast Virginia, up toward Richmond. So again, uh, any tropical system, we saw it with tropical storm Hermine, because of the cyclonic um, nature of the storm, you can get quick tornadoes. They do not tend to be long lasting, um, but they tend to be really, really quick. So you wanna have those ways to get warnings so you can seek shelter as soon as you can. All right, so at this point, it is all you. Uh, right now, you can jot down my email address. It's eric.hayden at noaa.gov. Um, the folks from the town of Beaufort, they, they shared a lot of links. I'll get with Rachel and, and uh, compile those, and we'll send those out tomorrow. Um, sometimes it takes a little while to get um, a longer video like this on YouTube. So I'd say by the end of tomorrow, expect an email from us. We'll have all the links that uh, Rachel talked about and, and the different people in the town, the links we talked about a certificate, and then the video uh, recording for YouTube. So at this point, it looks like everybody pretty much popped back on. I'm gonna go through the questions um, and see what we've got. At this point, if, if you wanna ask a question, just ask it through, through the webinar itself. Once we go through all the written questions, just raise your hand if you want to ask a verbal one, and you can certainly do that. So let's see what we've got here. So this is a good one for anybody in the town. I think um, it's, uh, Rachel, you had sent this one out. Did you want, um, are you guys all cool with that? If I read that one out or? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, feel, I'll feel that. Okay. So I'll read it out loud for everyone. Uh, this is a this is a good question. We got a couple of these. And again, don't don't be shy. Um, there's no no silly question. Um, that's why we're here. If you're like me, I'm usually chicken. I don't like asking questions in front of people. Just email us, and we'll we'll get you the answer. So th this is from several questions from uh, residents. Um, who's responsible to give the citizens hurricane information with regards to flooding, shelters, what to bring? Uh, how long to expect electricity to be out? Uh, is it the county itself or the town of Beaufort? Um, and this person mentioned they, they can watch the Weather Channel, but um, a lot of times it doesn't give that specific of information. I know I've seen the crawls and it'll kind of do a good overall job, but for the town of Beaufort, when they're looking for that type of information, um, where should they reach out to? Right, so typically, uh... As a storm approaches, we'll have a control group, which is uh, all the the uh, leaders around the county, and they'll get us as much information as we we can possibly get, and we will try to transmit that information on a a fairly routine basis with with our videos. Ultimately, my goal is to get as much information into the hands of the citizens as I possibly can, so that they can make informed decisions. Uh, mandatory evacuation, as we know, is not mandatory. Uh, so it's ultimately up to those families to to, to take this information and and make those those decisions. Things like uh, shelters, uh, the the county manages the shelters. Uh, in the uh, case of Hurricane Florence, we were expecting a Category Four hurricane, so they were not initially going to open the shelter. So they were going to ask everybody to go to Nightdale, which is up in Wake Wake County. But as as it looked like uh, Florence was going to steer westward, they did open up uh, Newport Middle School as a as a shelter. Uh, in a COVID-19 environment, it's a little bit more complex now. So instead of opening one shelter, they're going to open up three shelters. One uh, a normal shelter with social distancing, a shelter for those that are most vulnerable, and another shelter for those that may. Uh, may be positive or may think that they're they're positive uh, with uh, with COVID-19. So we will get as much information as we possibly can to people. Uh, there is transportation that the county will arrange and they have their emergency number that you can call to get transportation and uh, also to get you to the shelter. Uh, and we will reiterate that that phone number as a storm storm approaches, but ultimately that the county will be be managing those those shelters. Very good. And I know Chief Ray mentioned before, um, you know, it's on the town website and, and the uh, uh, Carteret County website, our um, slash hurricane prep. Um, he had mentioned the evacuation plan and know your zone. It's a campaign um, that North Carolina Emergency Management had tested for a year or two and then uh, became uh, true this year. So you can get more information uh, by you know going to any of those websites we mentioned, and we'll have this in there to know what zone you're in and things like that. So a lot of, lot of good information on those websites we mentioned. Um, and again, you'll, you'll have access to that um, once we send the final email out. Very uh, good. Eric, there's, there was another question about how, how long it, can you expect the electricity to be out? Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll use Hurricane Florence as another example there where the whole grid was out, uh, at least in Eastern Carteret County. And uh, you know we were kind of tracking where the, the uh, power trucks were. And uh, it ended up being seven days. I mean, on hour two of day one of Hurricane Florence, the power went out in Beaufort, and we got it back seven seven days later. So that's that needs to be part of your your planning calculus, uh, as Chief Chief Ray had had said. Uh, but we're not going to really know. Uh, you know, we we watch the trucks, we watch them go to the substation, and then then we watch them as they attach each of the different areas of the community back. Uh, but it, it's kind of a, a guessing game as to when it's actually going to going to be back completely. And even even then, uh, we had our grocery stores where uh, the the food had just just gone bad. And so even then, once the power did come back on, it took a while to get those those grocery stores back back up and running. So so again, uh, as an individual family and as a community, we, we really have to plan for for much longer than the the three days that we talked about a couple of years ago. Now now we're looking at that seven to ten days. And Mayor, I want to also add. So so much of that depends on the strength of the storm, the damages that are incurred. So it's one of those things you can't really predict. Uh, I mean, you know, Beaufort 
had seven days, but down east was closer to two weeks without power. So there's so many variables that go into that. Right, and and also uh, the the question about uh, which roads are going to be open. That that's a great question. Certainly, the county will have some situational awareness. Uh, Chief Burdett, uh, is would you would you recommend that the uh, that they talk to the uh, highway patrol or or North Carolina DOT? Who who would have the best information on that? I think he's frozen. Um, okay. So I, I do I do want to say that um, a, lo a lot of us uh, behind the scenes have access to um, the county's emergency management program. And so when there are road closings that affect the town, we do try and post those immediately onto our web um, our website. And it's typically Facebook that it gets to first, just because of the logistics of getting that information out there. But we do try and post that as soon as possible. And Chief Burdett is really good about sharing that information as well. Right. Rachel, I will tag on to that. Um, DOT has some good websites about road closures or the ability to get through. What I would encourage is you play with those websites now. Don't wait three hours before storm or three hours after storm to try to figure it out. So, you know, get in, look for the information. The county's good at putting information out there. The town is very good. We do our best to try to keep with the videos and try to keep the information that Rachel pushes out through the town. So I encourage you to get friendly with National Weather Service website, websites, DOT's websites, uh, Carter County Emergency Management, Town of Beaufort. Uh, make yourself familiar now with these, with these, be involved. And another thing we can't stress enough is when the town is under a curfew to really respect that because the reasons for that are because of the potential dangers that are out there, um, whether it's first thing after the storm at first light, and we're, we're as staff trying to assess the damages and the areas that need work, or if it's, you know, in a situation where there's no power and the stoplights aren't working. So really, if there's a curfew, everyone just needs to stay put. Uh, we will let you know when it is safe to get out and about. Very good. I don't see any other written questions that we have in there now. Uh, so at this time, if anybody's got an, um, a question that um, they'd ask verbally, you can just click on the raised hand feature. Um, we'll unmute your mic and then call on you. See if we've got anybody out there. I know I recognize a few folks who appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, and again, the recording will be on YouTube uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Any brave souls that want to raise a hand, we'll, we'll call on them. All right, I don't see anything. So at this point, um, we're we're good on our end. If you all want to wrap things up, just uh, appreciate the town working with us to to uh, get this information out. We look forward to to doing a vert, uh, uh, in person form because I want to see people in person as soon as we can. Um, but I think this was good. Uh, we'll we'll get this up on YouTube and and share with those that had to drop off or that may not have been uh, able to attend. So I'll let you all close out with uh, any any final words that you have. Well, Eric, uh, we, we really appreciate our partnership with the National Weather Service. And, and thanks again for hosting this this webinar, this important information to, to, to get out to everybody, uh, you know, in the middle of the season right now. And just uh, in, in closing, uh, Hurricane Dorian was still off the coast of Florida had not moved westward yet before it started tr its trek northbound. And using the information from, from you guys and the National Hurricane Center, we were able to make some, some fairly tough decisions about Hurricane Dorian, just based on the confidence that we had in, in your modeling. So so again, we, we just appreciate uh, the opportunity to work work with you folks and, and, and to be able to develop that picture so that individual families can make those, those, those decisions in advance of a storm. You're most welcome. All right, unless just, anybody else has anything to say, we'll we'll wrap it up. I just want to thank you, Eric, for what you guys do all day, every day, year round. Thank you for being there for our community. No problem at all. We appreciate you uh, you know forwarding those messages on. It's great to see a, a town so so well uh, organized and, and forward thinking with this. So this is really, really good. So we'll we'll wrap things up. We'll get this on YouTube by the end of tomorrow. Rachel, you and I will chit chat, get those links together, and you'll have an email. Uh, by the end of tomorrow. So hope everybody has a good night. Enjoy the rain we're getting. We need some of it. And let's hope that we uh, remain fairly quiet the rest of the hurricane season. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.